Welcome to class, my wonderful students. Um, I had a student ask me on text messaging last night in web courses, uh, Dr. B, what are your office hours? And I gave the I didn't mean to be mean about it, but I gave the student a little bit of the business because they're right up there, right in front of your nose, every, right here, uh, 9 o'clock to 12 noon, uh, Wednesday mornings. Uh, so, and I'll always have this intro slide up, the beginning, first few minutes of lecture. Let me draw your attention. The SI schedule is now set. That will always be up on this intro slide as well. And let's talk about it for a few minutes. We have a few things to talk about, this and that. Um, as I definitely try to get there as often as you can, even if you can only go for one, you know, for half an hour twice a week, it's going to help you. Or you can only go to, like, the Tuesday session. It is going to help you in itself. And then you'll make connections with friends there, or make, you'll make friends, maybe. Uh, and they, they can become uh, study partners with you. And that is the real way to really start to excel in this class is to work with another person. They have a saying, iron sharpens iron. And in this class, you if you can find a good study partner, whether it's Darien or office hours with me or SI or somebody that is in your dorm and in this class or the morning class, um, just talking with another human being is very very helpful because you have to think about everything you say well hopefully you think about everything you say you don't just you know blab things straight out of your brain uh, without thinking I guess sometimes you do that but at any rate SI is very good for that and what we found over the um, past few semesters is that if you do go consistently, you know, every week, at least once or twice or more, uh, you'll have, pro on probability, uh, one letter grade higher than the people that don't go to SI. It is definitely an advantage. Now, if you can't make it, you can't make it. But this schedule is pretty nice because it uh, has late afternoon except for Friday, but we don't have class on Friday, so that's all right. You know, so if you can make Friday, you'll probably be able to talk about Thursday and maybe even the previous Tuesday. All right, Monday uh, will get you ready for Tuesday lecture. So it's there's a lot of good uh benefits to this schedule because some semesters the si schedule is really not so good but this schedule cody is quite good so i recommend it to you all right another topic number two i uploaded clicking data for each of you that clicked and are registered uh from Tuesday's lecture, I uploaded it yesterday afternoon, I think, and I immediately got a message. You know, people, hey, Dr. B, I got a zero. What, what's going on with that? And I told them that, that I'd try to explain it in lecture. Here's the explanation. And in fact, here's a, a text message from a student. I can't remember who it was. Um, I took the name off. I just received an email, not from me. I don't send out email to you guys. Uh, must have been from web courses. I just received an email start stating I got zero out of four for the L5 I click questions. I attended class yesterday and answered all the questions. 
I am confused as to why I got zero out of four. Is there a way in which you can change the grade? Answer to that last question is no. And the reason is that student actually did get zero. But what he's, that student is not um, appreciating is the fact that for every lecture that we have clicker questions, there's two data that I upload. How many you answer and how many you get correct. Now, it looks like this. Here's the homework up here, the top two lines, homework three and homework four. And then down here, if you haven't already looked, is L5 answers and L5 correct. Now, this uh, number reflects how many that you have answered out of four. And then this one down here reflects how many you actually got correct. Now, this is my student test demo account. And it's, this is not an actual student, but the student that did uh, text me with that, whoever it was, I can't remember, um, they didn't get any points correct, any questions correct. Now, most of you got uh, a question correct uh, last time. Um, and so the reason that you get two is because I use both of those uh, figures. The data from L5 answers and then L6 answers today and then L7 answers and all the way to the end of the semester L30 something answers I add all those up and if you've added uh, if you've answered 85 percent of the questions you get 25 out of 25 for your class participation grade which is on the syllabus as we discussed two weeks ago the number that you get correct is used to calculate bonus points for you at the end of the semester. So sometime in December, after we, we have used the last uh, clicker question for the semester, I'll compute how many you actually got correct. You'll be able to figure it, keep a running tally as, as we go through the semester if you look at your grades page. But I'll do that for everybody. And then students that get 75% of the clicker questions correct, they get four bonus points. Okay, it's a performance bonus. And you won't know until the very end of the semester, unless you absolutely get every question right. Uh, then maybe you'll know a little bit sooner than everybody else. But right up to the buzzer, if, if so if you get 75% or more correct, uh, over the semester, then you get four bonus points. And you can think of those bonus points as being attached to your final exam score, whatever that works out to be. All right, so four bonus points on the final. All right, so that's why I keep those two uh, lines separate on the grades page. And that is why that particular student actually didn't have a zero. He had four out of four answered. So he's doing good for his class participation. But he biffed it at least Tuesday for the bonus. But he's got the whole rest of the semester to get himself back up to 75%. So, so you want to click in class and you want to at least participate. And if you can click with accuracy and thought, you can get 75% correct. That's a B. So if you can get a B on the clicker questions, all of them for the semester, you'll have four bonus points for the semester exam. Okay. Questions about that? Yes. I cannot hear you. If you, it, it, it's it's never wrong. So you might have answered late. You might have answered it the last second after I closed it. So I, I usually give a countdown. So if, you know, or you might have gotten to class late. I mean, I don't want to, you know, single you out and embarrass you or anything. But, you know, that's other students. That's how it happens, you know. So, but that's why, you know, we got a little leeway, 85%, you know. So if you, if you, if you're, if you're late for one question once in a while, it's not going to kill you. And on average, if you have one or two lectures that you have to miss for any reason, regular lectures, 
you could still get that 85% answered uh, pretty easily by the end of semester. So, all right, let's keep going. I, I, as long as this image is up, I want to point out uh, once again these gray rectangles. I do not want you to pay any attention to them. They are heinous, misleading. But nobody knows how to get rid of them. I talked to the system administrator, the sysadmin, uh, yesterday. And he, he, does, he doesn't know how to turn it off. Only, And I don't even know if Kansas, or excuse me, not Kansas, Canvas. I don't even know if they know how to turn it off. I wish I could turn it off. Because it has nothing to do with your grade. So pay no attention to those things. And I even have this little blurb right above it. X, X, X. Pay no attention to the grades and percentages in the gray rectangles at the bottom. Okay, try not to forget that. All right, homework. Item four. In this and that. Uh, homework calculation items. I got a, another discussion posting about number 12. Um, and the student says, is anyone having any trouble entering the last question? on the quiz, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what I, I looked at, this particular student, and, and then somebody, Cameron, Rolf, and then Tanya, uh, I, ma'am, said, said a reply, and then I replied, um, what you're looking at is that on a calculation question in homework, so not a multiple choice, not a matching, but if you have to type in a number on a calculation question, it resets to a new random value after the for the next attempt. So you might not have the same numbers to calculate with on attempt number two, and then different again on attempt number three, and then different yet again on attempt number four. So what that means is you can't get the answer correct on, like, attempt number two, and they say, okay, I got this bagged. Um, I'll just keep typing in, you know, 2.46 or whatever. Your answer was correct. That might not work. You can't recycle your answers, okay? And this student was trying to do that. And it's, it's you know, it's common mistake first week or two of the semester. All right, so bear that in mind. And as always, my admonition to you, my encouragement to you, my mental guidance to you, if I could, you know, if I had telepathy, I would telepath to you, read carefully. Read carefully on the homework. Read carefully on clicker questions in class. Read carefully, especially on exams. Uh, because if you read too fast, you miss something, you're SOL, especially on exams. You might know how to do it, but if you read too fast and you miss some crucial thing that you ought to have, if you had read it, you would have gotten it right, but you didn't read it carefully and you got it wrong, you're SOL. Okay, so don't, uh, don't be like that. Just read carefully. Okay, questions about homework calculations. Yes, Dante. Yeah, because he was slow. The alien was slowing down. Yeah, and if so, if you consider rightward to be positive, then losing rightwardness is it's gaining negativeness, leftwardness, or slowing down. Okay, so uh, the chickens, the Oviedo chickens, are speeding, speeding up. Who here is from Oviedo? And nobody's admitting to being from Oviedo. Well, if, if, if you're not from Oviedo, if you're not from around here, you may not have heard about the Oviedo chickens. 
If you drive up to Oviedo, north of campus, uh, like to the public library or to Popeye's or the post office, there's chickens that just roam around on the streets. I mean, there's like... So that was a realistic example. That, I mean, there really are Oviedo chickens that, you know, they run free and, you know, scare little kids and stuff and, you know. All right. Bookshelf, textbook, e-text. There's a feature in there that allows you to subscribe to my sticky notes, my little yellow post-it notes that I can type in. And you can type them in too, except I'm not going to subscribe to yours. But you can subscribe to mine. Here's what the bookshelf application looks like on my computer. And here's a, a note. I typed this in this morning at home. And I'm going to start typing in more and more notes, especially excuse me, especially before lecture as I plan the lecture based on whatever is in the textbook. So if you, if you subscribe to my notes, my highlighters, they call them, then uh, you'll be able to study kind of like uh, with my guidance. All right, my, you know, it's, it's my writing. I wrote this part of the book. And uh, so these are my comments about that for lecture. And so if you, if you subscribe using this email address, brewbeckner at knights.ucf.edu, you can see all my notes. It works. It, we, I've already tried it out with Derry and stuff. It works pretty good. You can probably do it right now if you have it. If you have your stuff on your iPhone, if you have bookshelf installed on your iPhone. And that's my last name with a spurious letter B inserted into it. Brew Beckner. I deliberately misspelled my own name because I never use this email address except for phony software email. You know how you gotta, you know, get some download. You gotta type in your email or something like that. So that's what I use it for. Uh, and so don't send me a message at this email address because a I, I hardly ever check it, and b even if I did check it, I wouldn't answer you on regular email. So, But you can subscribe to my notes using this email address. In Bookshelf, and if you and your friends on your dorm floor or your apartment complex have a study group and it's working good, you can all subscribe to each other's notes, you know. And it might, it might end up being uh, a nice study tool. And it'll definitely be a good study tool if you subscribe to mine. So try that out if you have a chance. Uh, any questions about subscribing? Okay, let's keep going. Um, last time we were talking about the distance triangle, and we're going to do a little bit of uh, reinforcement of the distance concepts, distance triangle, and distance rectangle for that matter. Uh, so let's do a couple uh, examples to reinforce the distance concepts, and then we'll do a little bit of clicking after that. So we'll start with homework number four. Item 12, which was the drop time uh, problem, number 12. And this is the one where a number is reset randomly for each attempt. So this is um, my student demo account, and it's set with 1.89 for delta t. Now, you might have had delta t equal to 1.16 seconds for your first attempt. All right. You, you calculate with 1.16 the same way that we're going to calculate with 1.89. OK. So you use the distance formula, the drop distance formula, 1 half gt squared. Uh, it's pretty cinchy, but let's just, let's just reinforce it. And the first thing to do is to compute 1.8 nine seconds quantity squared. Now when you do that you put the 1.89 in your calculator 
and you get 3.5721. All right, that's easy. But then you also have to square the seconds units. So delta T quantity squared has a number, and then the symbol seconds squared, S to the second power. All right, you've got to remember that. Because that second squared unit cancels with your next move. One half G, you got to multiply that result. Uh, 3.5721, uh, Caitlin, by uh, one half G. Now, one half G is 4.9 meters per second per second. Or, you know, in compact notation, 4.9 meters per second squared. Now, so if you think about it, that second squared of the denominator of item 2B2, 4.9 meter per second squared, that second squared down in the denominator cancels with the second squared up here. And so the result is meters. Your second squareds cancel. And so the distance, when you calculate it, here's the, the you know, this is my Mac OS calculator here. Uh, and so when you calculate it all out, you get 17.50329, and the unit of measurement for that is meters. All right. So, Stephen, when you're doing this, you know, you, if you, you carry all your numbers, and then at the end you might have to round off. Now, on the homework, I told you to give me the answer to the nearest tenth of a meter. All right. So then you have to decide, all right, what's my nearest tenth? And in this case, it's 17 or it's 17.5. Right, so that's the number you type in. All right. Now, as as I mentioned, the numeric input or the numeric part of the text of each calculation question uh, can change from one attempt to another. Now, in this problem, there's only one number, the drop time. But in future problems, you might have two or even three numbers that change all around. So you got to read carefully. But if you read carefully and do the calculation carefully, you'll score correctly. All right. Now, I want to uh, work out another example f uh, with you uh, from or reminiscent of this famous scene in the minds of Moria, the, the Fellowship of the Ring movie with Pippin and he, he dropped that stone down the well so we're gonna we're gonna drop a, a rock down the well and hopefully we will not awaken any of the evil things that live down deep in Moria but we will be able to calculate how deep it is so let's say for this second example that we drop the rock down the well and then we listen for the splash and it's 3.2 seconds later. Now we're gonna we're gonna neglect the speed of sound coming back up the well. Okay, so we're gonna assume that it, the well's not that deep, that you have a significant delay. So we're gonna assume that it's 3.2 seconds to fall, and we're gonna figure out how deep it is. Well, what you have to figure out is um, the drop distance. You know, so so Pippin is up at the top of the well and he actually bumps something over the edge and it falls down and it takes a certain amount of time and then he hears it and you know all, all kinds of stuff breaks loose but this is the basic if if he had been in this class he'd have been able to tell Gandalf how deep it was how deep the doo-doo was that they were about to get into but no he didn't take this class all right but we do we've got it uh, 1 half gt squared, here's the plug-in step. Okay, there's 0 0.5 right here in the parentheses. That's the 1 half in 1 half gt squared. And then here's g, 9.8 meters per second squared. And as I've mentioned, this is the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth and Mars has a different value for G. The moon has a different value for G. Okay. Venus has a different value for G. 
on Earth it's 9.8. So pretty much anywhere from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the deep blue sea, it's uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then here's the drop time, 3.2 seconds. And I've got that in square brackets, and we're squaring the square brackets. So your next move, this is like your intermediate step here. And this is if you're doing it on paper. You can probably do all this ca carefully and well and quickly on your calculator if you know what you're doing and if you don't blow it. But anyways, if you're doing it on paper, here's like an intermediate. You know, one-half times G is 4.9 meters per second squared. And 10.24, that's the square of 3.2. So 3.2 quantity squared is 10.24. And then seconds up here in the square brackets, and then square the, 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 the square brackets, uh, that gives you seconds squared on the inside. And now my squaring is all done, and it's all contained in the square brackets in this intermediate step. Okay? And when you calculate now, you get about 50.176 meters. And you can round off if you need to. But whatever it is, that's pretty deep. That's about 165 feet. And I don't think there's a lot of water wells here in Florida that are that deep. Most people have water just a few feet deep in their wells. All right, so there's that question. There's that example. Questions about it? Dost thou have a question? Forsooth. Okay, so you guys are geniuses on this. Put a lot of these on the test, right? Midterm one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? Maybe. Uh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Now, let's uh, kind of put them all together. Let's kind of gather our thoughts. We've gone through some examples. Now, let's kind of get an overall view of these equations. Everybody's nervous about equations and formulas and stuff. All right. Let's kind of organize them, and maybe you'll, if we get them all racked up into a row and a stuff, hopefully you'll be a little less nervous. All right, and what the way that we're going to do this, the organizing principle that we're going to use is the idea of um, distance polygons. You know, we used the distance triangle and the distance rectangle uh, last time, and we got some equations from that. And we're going to do the same thing here. So we have a bunch of equations. Um, the drop distance equation is the one we just used, 1 half gt squared. And students, I have a note here, v subscript i, that's the initial speed. In other words, you're up on top of the library, and you're holding the water balloon. You're not throwing it downward. You're just releasing it so that its initial velocity is 0. v subscript i is 0. And if it is, then this is the distance that it falls. Now, here is something um, for any acceleration. And so this could be, you know, a Ferrari with an acceleration, you know, 4.5 4 meters per second squared, you know, horizontally. That's, so this is a generic formula, 1 half at squared. And this is something accelerating from rest. We could use this if something is slowing down from a high speed, but it's a little trickier. But if you're accelerating forward from rest, uh, then this is the formula that you would use. Now, here's an even simpler formula that we've talked about. And this is a little bit different notation, though, from what we've talked about. Uh, final position x, x axis final position, x subscript f equals x subscript i, your initial position on the x-axis, plus Darien, vi times t, that's your initial speed, 
times how much time you're traveling at that speed. Okay? Speed times time equals distance. So this one, to, f to predict the final position, x subscript f, you need the initial position, and you need the initial speed. And then you have this equation that allows you to put them together. This is the equation of motion uh, for something at constant speed, in other words, with acceleration zero. And, and you know what you could do for a colloquial uh, side note? Uh, this is cruise control. All right. So you're on the turnpike, and you're at 65, then you hit the cruise control, and you just kind of you know, relax a little bit, head for Miami or wherever it is you're going. Or if you're kind of nervous and scaredy cat, 25 miles an hour, and then you hit the, the cruise control button. I don't have cruise control in my vehicle, so. But anyways, this is the cruise control formula for final position X, or final position on the X axis. If you have a bit of acceleration, A, this formula will get you the final position. Now, it's built on the previous formula. So this is on the X axis, final position. And you have to know the initial position on the X axis. You also have to know the X component of the initial velocity, V subscript IX. That's the initial velocity X component. Multiply that by the time. And now here's your acceleration term, 1 half AT squared. So it, they all are working together. When you're in motion, and then you, so this is like you in cruise control at 65, and then you want to get around a truck, you got to hit the gas. So you keep your 65, and then you put a little bit of metal to the floor. And you get a little acceleration, and this will help you figure out your position. All right? Free fall. All right. If you're going up and down in free fall, no problem. You know, so if you're up, so this one would be something that starts at position Y subscript I, the initial position on the Y axis. And if it starts with a little bit of velocity, a little bit of vertical speed, so this one, uh, Colin, is the y component of the initial velocity. All right. So speed times time here. Now, if you're if you've ever watched a basketball game, the start of the basketball game, the referee tosses the ball straight up in the air, a jump ball, the opening tip off, and then you know somebody jumps and swats the ball. So he starts it upward with a little bit of speed before he releases it, all right? That speed at release would be V, I, v subscript IY. Now, if the referee is a Decepticon trying to trick everybody in the building, he might throw it downward. You know, he'll go like this. He'll fake up, and he'll throw it down, you know, and he'll get everybody all messed up. That would be V-I-Y, a negative number. You know, it's like minus 2 meters per second. That would signify down, throwing it downward. This equation can handle that. So you're, if you're up there at the top of the library and you decide to throw it downward, your y, initial Y position might be, you know, 30 meters or whatever the height of the library is. And then if you throw it downward, then it would be, you know, negative 2 meters per second, say, times T. And then you'd have G. Now, make a side note here. In this equation especially, you must use 
negative 9.8 meters per second squared for G. And if you do, you also have to use a minus sign in the velocity here to represent um, downward, positive in the velocity here, or the speed term, to represent upward. You know, So the regular referee throws it upward, positive 2 meters per second. The Decepticon referee throws it downward, negative 2 meters per second. Okay. And then this is your bookkeeping starting point, y subscript i, the initial position on the y-axis. All right. So these are the equations of motion. Now, how do these connect up to the distance polygons, the triangles and the rectangles? We'll tackle that next, but, bef but before we do, we have a question here. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying if you throw it downward, use a minus sign. If you throw it upward, use a positive sign. If you want, yeah, you have. We'll. I'll try to do an example. Uh, the stu the student up here. What is your first name again? John. John is up here asking me a question about how to use the minus sign in this equation. So he's saying, would this would it change this plus sign here into a minus sign? And the answer to that is, yeah, it depends on how you decide to write your numbers down. And I'll, what I'll try to do is work out an example with you on, and actually we might have a homework problem like this for homework five with this equation, kind of a brain burner. And for sure I'll work out a problem with you on Tuesday next week for this, okay? All right, now, just, oh, another question. Yeah, these are all figuring out final positions. Now these up here are, are distances from your starting point. So this is like XF up here as well. But I usually use the symbol D to, to represent distance. But these are these are actual X coordinates. Final. And then the I symbolizes initial. So if you know initial conditions, position and speed, position and velocity, and this time evolution equation, this one, this one, or this one, you can figure out where it's going to be at some later time t. Okay, Dante. Yeah, if you're a regular referee with a positive viy here, you'd still use negative nine because if and the the minus sign in this g here, negative nine point eight meters per second, it's going to be take a thing away on the way up. The ball gets slower, right? You know, you throw it upward, it slows down, and eventually it stops and then it starts coming back down. This will take care of all of that. It'll e even take it on the way to take care of it on the way down. So, all right. Now, distance polygons. Da 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 da. Distance triangle. Everywhere you see a t squared in there, that's basically a distance triangle behind that part of the formula. All right, so 1 half AT squared, 1 half GT squared. Yeah, those are distance rectangles. Excuse me, distance triangles. And then the distance rectangles, those are the cinchy ones. They're right here. T to the first power. All right. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. I got up early this morning. I usually get up every morning at 5. Raise your hand if you get up at 5. Ooh, not bad. More people than live in Oviedo. Yeah, I always get up at 5. Today I got up at about 4.30. Couldn't sleep. I was already awake. So I'm yawning right now. Sorry about that. Anyways, these are the distance uh, polygons, rectangles, and triangles. And so let's try to remember that. It's, it's a nice kind of a mental device to help you understand how these equations of evolution come from the study of the velocity versus time graph. Okay, 
Let me repeat that sentence for you, if I can. This page allows you to connect the idea of velocity polygons from the velocity versus time graph with the equation of motion. And these are all equations of motion. For something that's either moving at a constant speed or something that's accelerating. Now, let me um, ask you to get your clickers out. And I want you to go to frequency BB. I synchronized roster this morning before the first lecture. And there's only about 36 students that haven't registered yet that have clickers but haven't registered. So um, uh, so most of you are on the system. If, if you didn't have it last time and you need to put the frequency on there, hold the power button down for a second and the square will start to flash and then type in the letters BB and you'll be on. You'll get the Go Nitro message. Now what we're going to do in this clicker question we're going to use a code table, and for each letter on the code, there's a, a word or a phrase, and with those phrases, we're going to put together a sentence, or you're going to put together a sentence, and then you're going to beam it up to my receiver here with your clicker by typing in a bunch of letters. Okay, now here's how you type in letters. When the question begins, you'll get the letter A, and I'll just I'll start the question now. Okay, and you should get the letter A, and then if that's the first letter in your sentence, then just keep it there. But if it's not, you go up and down, and you choose a number or a, or a letter. Okay, just like on an old-time cell phone, and you don't know what the question is yet, so don't start clicking. But you can fool around with it if you want. And you can change it. And then you push the right arrow key once you've got the first letter down. And then you go to your next letter with the right arrow key. And you go up and down and, you know, type in the next letter. And so on and so forth. And then you can go with the left arrow key and the right arrow key. You can go back and forth, left and right, and edit your answer. So you, if you think, oh, I'd rather have the letter C there, you can go back and change it to C. And then when you're complete, you have to hit the send button. Now, don't say send anything because you don't know what I'm going to ask you. But I'm going to ask you a question here. I'm going to give you a, a set of letters that correspond to phrases and words, and you're going to put together a sentence. Now, this is not a Chuck Norris question, but it is kind of a goofy question. It's not a science question. We're, so we're just going to do this for fun, and um, so hopefully you'll have – a little bit of amusement for this. When you hit when you hit the send button, you should get a check mark uh, for it. Now, um, here is the question: Create a true statement using the following code table. And there's an example for you: J O M R Q. All right. Now, try to create a true statement. And we'll look at some of your answers when you're finished. I'll give you a couple minutes. So this is, this is just kind of, so just have fun. You can, I think the limit is 14 characters, so you can't type a sonnet, much less a novel, but you can type in a, a fairly good sentence. Has anybody seen Sharknado 3? I I have to uh, I, have, I haven't even seen Sharknado 2. I've seen Sharknado 1. That was pathetic. Yeah, question. Don't put spaces in, just give me words. So, consider spaces as being understood.
Are you starting to experience feelings concerning Brittany or French fries or or both? I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be judgmental. Thirty seconds. Come on, you guys. We had a really funny one in the first lecture. <laughs> oh, Lord. 15 seconds. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Very interesting. All right, I'm going to stop the question now. 180 people voted. All right, now let's look at what you guys voted for. Okay, always popular, leave Brittany alone. Um, next one, J-O-N-A. Uh, I always consume French fries. Okay, that's it. That's a highly normal uh, sentence. Uh, A G O F. Hmm. A French fries are always enjoyable. That's true. J N A. I consume French fries. Jonas. Uh, I. Always consume French fries alone. Ooh, the secret French fry eater. All right, uh, let's go down. Let's look at some of these other ones. Jonah, I always consume French fries. All right, Jonas. Lona. We always consume French fries. John R Q J O N R Q. I notice everybody's using either I or me or we. I always consume sh what <laughs> shark antennas. Oh, dude, that's my. It, Yeah, my, a, a, yeah, actually, mine is. All right, let's go look. Whoa, let's look at this one. T-E-S-W-P-R. Find nauseous tornadoes and regurgitate french fries. <laughs> what? U-I with Nobody. <laughs> Whoa. Here's a novel. <laughs> e R H M Y N W N O Z. All right. E R Nauseous Sharks H Swim. With Brittany, the, the sharks get nauseous when they swim with Brittany. Okay. W and consume antenna alone. That's some strange sharks. Uh, anyway, now the thing I want to point out to you, this is kind of goofing around. You know, Brittany and sharks and stuff. French fries. But notice that there's like a zillion different ways you can describe how much you like free uh, French fries. And it's still a true concept. 
Now, when we apply this question method to like waves or momentum or chemical reactions, you're going to have the chance to express your thoughts in a creative manner. And everybody in this class can theoretically can have a different sentence that they send in. Now, these ones, look at this. All, you know, I can look at all these. I can decode these on a spreadsheet pretty quickly and read them and grade them very quickly. And look at these. Each one of these, there's only one person that sent these in. Added like 200 people in here. So you could have a true sentence and still be the only person that sent that exact sentence. Now, if you th the reason that's important is if you think about a regular test, a calculation it's like Thomas Brickner mind control. I set up the problem, and if you don't get the number I'm looking for, that's t as your SOL. T O A S T, toast. So that's like c the control zone. Multiple choice matching is the same. Multiple choice, if you don't cor correct, if you don't. Uh, select the first, the, or excuse me, if you don't select the correct letter, A, B, C, D, or E, that's it. I'm in control. I write the problem, and you gotta, you got to make it, you know. So that's me up here being, yeah, let's see if you can do it. Do, you know, that's me telling you to hop, skip, and jump and do my dance. But this... This is completely different. This is me at this is more like a regular conversation. This is me asking you a question and you expressing yourself the way that you want to. So if you have some abstract concept about french fries that you've never expressed to another human being, you can do it this way. But we're not going to have french fry questions on the test, not even the final. But we will have questions about waves, interactions, all kind of things in lecture and on exams. And so this is a really, really good questioning strategy. And you've now practiced one of each of the three different test modes we will use with iClicker. We've done alphanumeric input with these code questions. We've done numeric input yet uh, Tuesday, last time. And we've done a bunch of multiple choice. Okay, so we, we've done all those. And some of the questions are really super. I love asking these kind of questions. They take a long time to grade, but not that long. And the other thing about this, if you kind of biff it, if you kind of blow it, these ones I can give you uh, partial credit as well. So if I ask you a three-point sentence formation question, and you kind of like have... Why, why, why at the end, Brittany, Brittany, Brittany? I'll just ignore that, especially if you, if you have some cool French fry concept before that, you know. So if you, you know, you can, on a question, on a problem like this, you can kind of, you can get partial credit because I'm a human being, I'm analyzing it. You know, a Scantron quest, a question, Scantron test, it's a machine. It doesn't care. If you have a smut, if you write a dot, if you bubble in a dot and then erase it, but you don't erase it well enough, and the computer thinks, oh, he put two dots, wrong. That's the that's a machine doing that. But I and so when that happens, I have to go and dig out your scantron and see if you really did erase the correct answer or if you erased the wrong answer and put in the right answer. So I can do that because I'm a human. Same thing with these. So. It's it's a it's a nice situation. It's a nice tool. All right, let's talk about chapter. Oh, let me get this out of the way here. Let's talk about chapter two. We're gonna. This is actually probably the most important chapter in the book. It's about Galileo's breakthrough. Uh, with respect to Aristotle. And it's a short chapter, and I want you to read it 
in its entirety this weekend and you'll have homework five it'll be ready for you by lunchtime tomorrow if not sooner you have that and it'll be due Tuesday and my comments about Aristotle here's a quote from his book physics book two each thing that exists by nature has within itself a principle of motion and of stationariness in respect of place or of growth and decrease or by way of alteration. Now, Aristotle was a pretty smart cat. And, you know, now nowadays we think, oh, well, Aristotle, he was an idiot. Or some people think that because he was so long ago and Galileo totally put Aristotle Galileo totally schooled Aristotle about 400 years ago and but you know but in reality Galileo had a lot of Galileo came up you know when he was in classes he studied Aristotle you know that was a big part of his study and Aristotle's worth studying, uh, but it's not the only thing to study if you care about physics. Now, ethics and stuff, you know, uh, biology and stuff, it's not a bad thing to study. But for physics, he made some errors, but he was, he was actually um, reasonable in a lot of things that he did, but he didn't have a lot of the same benefits that Galileo did. For, for instance, he didn't have really good mathematical development at that time but that Galileo did. Another thing that Galileo had was uh, Galileo had um, excellent equipment. Galileo invented the telescope uh, as a device for observing um, the night sky, for observing um, the moon. For instance, nobody realized it until about the late 1500s or early 1600s. Uh, Galileo, I think it's early 1600s, he started observing the moon with the, you know, some guy, somebody in, in Holland invented it. But they were just looking at things, you know, around Holland. You know, so they were looking at tulips and, you know, all kind of, you know, the you know, the dikes in Holland and ships and but nobody thought to look up but Galileo decided to look up and what he saw the moon is it's filled with mountains and valleys craters shadows bright you know nobody knew that they thought oh it's just this big sphere up there you know nice as, but it's not it's it's like this you know roisterous topography up there on the moon the moons of Jupiter no, everybody thought Jupiter was just like this star out there that goes around the sky and stuff. Uh, but it, Jupiter has moons. We now know that. It's got a, a, a whole huge flock of moons. And Galileo dis discovered the four biggest. Uh, the rings of Saturn. Now, his telescope wasn't good enough to resolve. He didn't, he didn't have quite enough to resolve the fact that they were rings. But he saw them. He thought they looked like handles on a coffee cup. He didn't realize that he was looking at rings because they were still at that distance. It was a little bit blurry, but he definitely got the moons of Jupiter, sunspots, the Milky Way. It's filled with stars. It's not. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the Milky Way. See, that's Florida. Florida is burns me. You, you know, there's so much moisture in the atmosphere and light pollution from Disney and Universal. On a clear night, you can't even see the Milky Way. It's up there, you know. And it, but if you go up to Ocala National Forest and go camping up there or something, and just stay the night up there somewhere, and you look up and it's a clear night and there's no clouds, you will see the Milky Way. It is lovely. Uh, and Galileo looked at it with a telescope, but he figured out, no, it's not, it's not like milk. It's not like spilled milk or f some fluid or something. It's zillions of stars. The biggest thing probably that he did was to figure out a third state of motion that Aristotle would never have savvied. Now, uniform motion from point A to point B um, it's pretty easy to understand. You know, you 
you go so many meters per second um, and if it's uniform you always go the same number of meters per second and you know if if you have a specific target you know you have a direction so that's the concept of velocity a speed in a direction and that's a fairly basic thing. Aristotle had a good idea about that. But Aristotle didn't really think mathematically. He thought verbally. I mean, he was like, he's really hard to understand. I mean, you really have to read him carefully. He didn't, he didn't have the same mathematical convictions that Galileo did. Uh, but, you know, the uniform motion is fairly easy to handle. Distance of time measurements or the state of rest. Distance and time measurements, your distance measurement stays the same if you're at rest. Uh, one of the things that Aristotle uh, studied was um, things, or tr tried to describe, I should say more accurately, is things that slow down and things that speed up. He, he tried to tackle accelerating things, but he had a real difficult way of looking at it and Galileo separated himself from that and in chapter 2 you will read about how Galileo separated himself from that now I want to go over his concepts of acceleration and these are direct quotes from the writings of Galileo the properties now you don't have to write these down they'll be in the podcast I have some pull quotes here let me read them carefully and quickly the properties belonging to uniform motion that have been discussed in the pre preceding section, but accelerated motion remains to be considered. So this is the beginning of the section where he started to tackle accelerated motion. First of all, it seems desirable to find and explain a definition best fitting natural phenomena. That is Galileo all over the place. The great book of nature. Nature, whose language is mathematical and written with triangles and circles and things like that. That's, that's right there. The explanation has to fit the natural phenomena. And it continues, for anyone may invent an arbitrary type of motion and discuss its properties. Thus, for instance, some have imagined helices and conchoids as described by certain motions which are not met with in nature. So Galileo saying, okay, you can study these things, but why, why do you want to bother? You never see them in nature. And they have very commendably established the property which these curves possess in virtue of their definitions. But we have decided to consider the phenomenon, phenomena of bodies falling with an acceleration such as actually occurs. So he's not dibbling off with these, these artificial things, which is, are nice. He's saying, let's get down to brass tacks. What do we actually see? Acceleration such as actually occurs in nature and make this definition of accelerated motion exhibit the essential features of, of observed accelerated motions. This is Galileo's prototype. And this is the crucial move that even 400 years later is still fruitful for us in astrophysics. And this, at last, after repeated efforts, we trust we have succeeded in doing. In this belief, we are confirmed mainly by the consideration that experimental results are seen to agree with and exactly correspond with those properties which have been, one after another, demonstrated by us. So he's saying, I back up my concepts with experiments. And Aristotle wasn't able to do that. Finally, in the investigation of naturally accelerated motion, we were led it by hand, as it were, in following the habit and custom of nature herself in all her various other processes to employ only those means which are most common, simple, and easy. And that is a conviction that Aristotle had as well, that the simple explanation was probably the true explanation. So here are a couple of pull quotes, three pull quotes for you. Uh, that I just went over, and you can jot these down. And we're getting into the idea that of acceleration. You know, how do you handle accelerated motion? Galileo was able to do it in a way that allowed him to separate himself from Aristotle. 
definitively and permanently. The master stroke of Galileo was begun in this section of his writings. Here's the famous experiment that allegedly Galileo did, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa experiment. You know, he dropped supposedly a cannonball and then a musket ball, you know, a big musket ball. Uh, and they fell. Now, Gal, uh, Galileo experimented and found that they fell at the same rate and landed at the same time. But Aristotle would have predicted that the, so Aristotle could have done this, but he never tried it. And Aristotle would have predicted that the heavier thing, the cannonball, would have fallen faster. That's what they thought, but it wasn't true. I observe a stone initially at rest, just like our drop distance formula, VI equals zero, falling from an elevated position on top of the UCF library, continually acquiring new increments of speed. Emphasize that one, continually acquiring new increments of speed. That is smooth acceleration. Delta V is the same for every second of acceleration or every millisecond or every time increment that you choose, the amount of speed you gain is the same if you're in free fall. So um, it repeats itself always in the same manner. So for instance, he could have started his, just as we did with Caitlin and all the guys on the aisle, start your, st your stopwatch and then record the time and, and measure the speed with a, you know, he didn't have a radar gun, but if he had, he could have done this. And every second, he would have measured another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Just like we have done. And that is why we say that the imp increase repeats itself. It's 9.8 meters per second of downward speed for every second of free fall, as we have discussed. And so Galileo, now he wasn't working in the metric system, but this is the, this is a table of results that, you know, maybe he could have done. And if we went over there to Pisa today and we had a nice radar gun and a good stopwatch, these are the results that we would get for every second of free fall. And as we say, this is the free fall acceleration at the surface of Earth. And it's different for every planet. The moon is different. 9.8 meters per second per second or 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, I want you to read chapter 2. And you can go ahead and start reading ahead in chapter 3 because we'll tackle that next week. There will be some homework, homework number five, ready for you by lunchtime tomorrow. It will be due on Tuesday, and I'll see you then. You're dismissed. One fourteen.